so uh, I, uh, we were all very impressed by uh, Greg Wolf and provoked by Greg Wolf papers, of course, paper about uh, uh, discussing the traditional history of the barbarians and, uh, of course, proposing something else like a fragmented history of, and histories and plural of the barbarians. But uh, I will still try to go back to the traditional evolution of the barbarians, let's say, in the Greek and Roman world and try to uh, ask some questions to you. And uh, I would be grateful if we have answers here or in a bar. <laughs> so. So, uh, yeah, um, about uh, the, the first point. So, uh, uh, we discussed today about when the barbarian story started. So, was it archaic or was it classical, as it is fashionable to believe in the last years? And um, we can uh, raise the question of uh, what was considered sometimes in more traditional bibliography as the first image of the barbarian. Uh, the Polyphemus um, poly story in the Odyssey, Polyphem the Cyclop as the first image of the barbarian. And the question would be, so, okay, we don't have the name of the barbarian in Homer, but we could still have already the notion and the representation, the image of the barbarian. And this would be Polyphem, who is savage, who is hostile to the foreigners, uh, who drinks a lot, like people in Trace from the traditional classical... Uh, representation uh, and uh, who is violent who, and so on. So we have clear representations that uh, this was not only Homeric in Odyssey but already in the seventh century. So was Polyphemus a barbarian for people in the seventh, sixth century, even if the name was not the, barbar the barbarian name, but what we can understand by the notion of the barbarian in archaic times. So my, my position is to, to think uh, that, um, of course, because the Greeks uh, uh, lived around the sea and they were always in contact with different populations, uh, the matter of the opposition to the other was always present and to a hostile opposition to the other end of the inquiring about the self and identity. So uh, I think that in the context of the Mediterranean, more, more precisely internal sea, his Greek history, uh, I tend to think that Greeks were provoked to think about the others and to have notions like barbarians already in, uh, in archaic times. So this internal sea, which is con conceptualized already in archaic times in the 6th century, uh, and we have the description, of course, the relationship between this Mediterranean, uh, this internal sea, and the Greek identity in Plato. So between the columns of Heracles and the Caucasus, the, leaves, uh, the Greeks are living, meeting all kinds of people and meeting all kinds of savage populations. This was about the, my question, if we can agree that uh, the notion of barbarian was invented, even if the name was not really associated with the, this notion already in the time of the colonizations. The, the second point was to discuss about uh, what happened in the classical times. Why do you have uh, this idea that the barbarians were really invented in the context of the Greek-Persian wars and that the image of the barbarian became popular in the 5th century? And, uh, of course, uh, I thought it a uh, text uh, very uh, often, maybe too often quoted, but uh, it was not quoted today to my... Uh, if I was, uh, if I'm right, it's this definition of the Greeks uh, uh, in uh, Herodotus in the book eight. So I think uh, what happens in the uh, fifth century, at least for me, it's just a suggestion, and I'm open to your criticism, is not that barbarian is invented, but that we have from the fifth century uh, onwards a clear definition of what the Greek is, and depending on this categories on this definition of the Greeks, we have better descriptions of what the others are in opposition with the Greeks. And this is why so the kingships of the Greeks in blood and speech, so speech, barbarians versus Greeks, blood, blood meaning not real connection, but invented genealogies, or in any case, more or less reconstructed genealogy, shrines of gods, so Greek gods versus other gods, and the practices, so sacrifices. The Greeks are opposed, of course, to the Scythians and to the Egyptians who sacrifice in a different way. And, of course, way of life, 
which will become in the, from the fourth century uh, onwards uh, another basis for defining the other. So uh, this uh, is for me uh, something like the representation of the uh, world of Herodotus more precisely uh, here with Greek and Persians in the middle of the world and then all kind of circles of barbarians. And I think that uh, what us as Hellenists can take and use from the uh, talks of the, our specialist of China is this image of different circles and different barbarism. There is no, for any civilization we know, not one barbarians, but many barbarians with many characteristics, and in some civilizations we have these circles. We saw them, so especially for the Chinese, uh, uh, for, for the Ch ancient China, that we find it precisely in Herodotus. And this, uh, I think, comes precisely because uh, from the f uh, 5th and the beginning of the 4th century, we have this reflection about what is the Greek, what is the human being, and which is the evolution of the human being in order to reach the highest point of development, which is the Greek being. And uh, another passage I would suggest to use in discussions about barbarians is this uh, Platon Protagoras, uh, the history of humankind. So the man was created naked, unshot, unbedded, unarmed. And Prometheus gave uh, arts and fire, so homo faber, the first, then the worship of God, then inventing the dwellings, clothes, sandals, beds, foods, and so on, then respect and right, so the law among the men, and then foundations of cities. Why I'm quoting this reconstruction of the human past, anthropological uh, discourse in Plato, because I think it can fit what Herodotus put on different circles of the world. So the Greeks are in the middle and they are the most advanced. More you go to the marches, farther you go into the history of the humankind. So the men of the origin, the ones who are naked and have nothing, are those at the extremity of the world, behind the, behind the, uh, the Scythians, so the anthropophagi and the ones who don't dress properly in the, in the European, uh, in the Euro-Asiatic steppes, or through, uh, behind the Ethiopians and so in the Libyans into the south. So I think that we can find some correspondence between these temporal uh, circles in Protagoras, the evolution of the human uh, being to the Greeks and the geographical circles in the world of Herodotus. This is why I think that in the fifth, fourth century, we have the Greek thinking about what the Greek is, what the uh, barbarian is. But for me, but in any case, I let you contradict me, not the invention of the uh, barbarian as a, as a notion. Uh, a third point, so uh, it was also discussed uh, in different papers today, this idea um, of uh, cosmopolitanism, isn't it, with uh, Alexander's ex expansion in, into the East and uh, this desire to create a common uh, uh, humanity. Um, this comes in a very conflictual context in the fourth century, of course, where we have in Isocrates, for example, the strong opposition between Greeks and Persians, so the tradition from the end of the sixth century, fifth century, beginning of the fourth century, but also a big question, which is raised, isn't it, especially in Demosthenes and the other orators, what are the Macedonians? Are they Greeks or are they barbarians? And of course, this, this is all the, uh, the political debate of the, beginning of the middle of the fourth century. And for me, this uh, Macedonian problem is a key for passing from classical to Hellenistic thinking about the barbarian because the, the masters of the world became what for them some were uh, barbarians. We, uh, some of the speakers here uh, underline the importance uh, of taking into consideration the fact that we have different texts from different genres and from different authors, and most of them are fragmentaries. I would add to this um, um, observation the fact that we can have texts which are uh, silent or who tells only a part of the story, and if we manage to read them, we'll find even more about uh, the barbarians. And such a text, I, it's for me, it's again a proposition and you can criticize it. This uh, mysterious periplus attributed to, to, to Skylax, so pseudo Skylax, uh, which must be dated in the, the last years of uh, Philip II, the father of Alexander. And we have the great um, edition and the um, 
translation, which is not easy to do by Graham Shipley uh, recently, and who uh, attributes uh, it to someone from the uh, school of Aristotle. Uh, why I'm mentioning this text? Because it's surprising to read it that he mentioned a lot of Greek cities around the Mediterranean, mentioning them that's Greek, uh, Hellenic cities, uh, polis Hellenis. Why this? It's like an inventory of Hellenis for me, in any case, around the Mediterranean. So I think we should read through this text in order to see the opposition between what is Greek around the Mediterranean and what is uh, debated, what is in con conflict, in contrast with the Greeks, behind these shores of the Mediterranean. So this kind of text, which only speaks in 80%, I think, of the mentions about the Greeks, speaks for me also about the barbarian for the cities which are not mentioned expressly at the Barbary. Um, we mentioned the Roman world and the Roman problem, and we discussed about the absence of the barbarians in Augustus' uh, uh, res geste. Um, it's another proposition. Maybe we can think about also, again, about the definition of the self in the Roman context and about what the Roman is. Um, I, I assume that uh, we should insist on the fact that uh, Romanitas, it's uh, quite different from the character of Hellenism and that the law, the juridical component of the Romanitas is quite important. So for the Romans, let's say, if at least from the citizenship uh, point of view, you, uh, any barbarian can become Roman when he gets the, 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 the Roman citizenship. And uh, this is uh, the example on which I'm working, the, the Pontians. Uh, so these uh, people uh, who correspond to the Roman province of Pontus, uh, which was established on the core of the Mithridates, the Pator kingdom in uh, northeastern uh, Turkey. And uh, we can see here uh, how um, the Pontians, uh, from the very fragmentary references we have in Cicero and Strabo. This will be our two termini. The C in Cicero time, we can still see an ethnos corresponding to a Hellenistic kingdom, which opposed Rome. So here we have an Hellenistic ethnos, an empire, which managed to, to organize, let's say, free world wars against, Ro against Rome. These pontiti are barbarians. When Strabo speaks after the foundation of the province, and we are only 50 years later, uh, Strabo is uh, born in the moment when Pontus was taken and uh, uh, Mitridates uh, was finally killed, uh, uh, died. Uh, uh, Strabo is also a Ponticus, but he's a Roman citizen because the term of Ponticus, of Pontian, became with the Romans a designation, of geographical designation of the province. So he's a... Uh, born in a Roman context and uh, uh, probably a Roman, uh, a Roman citizen. Um, why I'm insisting on this, and there are other so, um, ideas we could discuss, so why this difference of mentality? Maybe we should uh, refer to the myth of the migration and of the asylum in the Roman, uh, uh, for the Roman identity, which was a foundation myth, uh, starting with the Trojans, isn't it? Or uh, with uh, Romulus, who founded Rome like an asylum. And not to make it too long, I'm coming to a last point in order to refer also to our colleagues who uh, discussed uh, later times. Um, so it is clear that for the pagans, uh, the Christians appeared as uh, barbarians. And you all see probably this famous movie Agora with Hypatia, which was put to death by um, terrible uh, terrorists or <laughs> terrible Christians who are all then barbar uh, only barbarians. But we have a um, reuse of the image of the barbarians in ancient texts, also in a purely Christian context. So, and here it's the, I want to evoke to you the context of one of the earliest heresy, the Marcion of Sinop in the second century AD, uh, who is presented by Tertullian, so between the second and the first century uh, AD, 
as a barbarian. So Tertullian makes a compilation from Herodotus and the Herodotian tradition, which was in the meantime known to Pliny and uh, Pomponius Mela, about what is the worst thing in the Black Sea. So they are all barbarians, they are the fiercest nations, they live in wagons, uh, they have libidinous desires without restraints, they are cannibals, they prefer warfare to marriage, they are Amazon, they have only rude nature and ferocity, and this is where Marthion is born. Of course, Marthion was born in Sinop, which was the capital of Michidates, which was a Greek city and uh, yeah, one of the most civilized o o of the area. But it's this reuse of uh, the characters of the barbarians for a purely Christian um, controversy, uh, which I wanted to sh show to you, to remind to you as a form of continuation of the speech about the, uh, the barbarian. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for trying to connect all the dots. Um, uh, with this, I think, it, yes, David is suggesting it's um, attractive. It's uh, warm here. We all want to go to um, some nice place. Uh, I, let me say that um, just a, a, a one or two sentences. I think what lies in the heart of our project is, that, is the fascination, our fascination with uh, um, how people came to understand others, to grasp others, and that's not an easy task, and not, neither historically nor even today. So often we um, understand others, the foreigner, uh, through a lens, with a, an, an image, and uh, a, so often with a, a conceptual construct. And uh, the barbarian happens to be one of the most persistent um, um, con conceptual, conceptual constructs. But this is not to say that this is the only one. There are other images of foreigners, and uh, there are um, um, different degrees of barbarians, as Greg um, um, explained very nicely. So. Um, 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 but, but this one, uh, the barbarian, uh, the, 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 the um, image of the barbarian is still probably with us, and we are, um, to a certain extent, um, barbarians in each other's um, conceptions of eyes um, is still true. Uh, there is one perhaps solution, though, that in, in 19, 1858, the British government um, well, I think forced the Imperial Qing government to sign a treaty in order to protect British um, um, uh, uh, interests in, in China. And uh, in Article 51 of, of that treaty, it's, uh, there's only a single clause. It said that henceforward, the, the Chinese were the yi, uh, then with the bracket, um, bracket, barbarian, should not be used of um, Her Britannic Majesty's government and um, um, uh, uh, her subjects as well. And I think that worked because we have ceased since then gradually to call the British or the Westerners barbarians. So there might be a solution, solution to that. Uh, with that, um, I would like to um, thank all of you for your um, uh, participation and uh, your enthusiasm in the project. Uh, we, um, the, well, then this is a, a, um, a practical um, question that we have in, in mind. Um, we, what to do with our presentations, we have put this, uh, uh, we have planned to put this on the website, the videos of, of uh, the institute here, but, um, um, we are not sure at the moment whether there should be book out of that. We are, I think this is a common uh, project, so we are uh, open to uh, suggestions, opinions. If uh, our the participants, uh, we have a sort of cons consensus that uh, it's worth publishing the book, a book uh, should be out, uh, published out of this, then we will, Anka and I will um, 
look for a solution, then in, in time we'll, we'll give you if, an answer whether we'll be able to do that or not. So uh, please, please, if you have any opinions and suggestions, please uh, feel free to um, tell either Anka and I. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, David. One comment. Just right. to thank Anka and Jan for putting this wonderful session together. We really are grateful to you. Thank you.